My name is uh, Jan Albert Hoosen, and I'm a Dutch journalist uh, working as the representative in Mexico for the Committee to Protect Journalists in uh, Mexico City. And as such, uh, I'm dedicated to the uh, promotion of press freedom in Mexico, the protection of journalists, uh, and uh, generally uh, promoting freedom of expression here. Well, CPJ is promoting press freedom in Mexico, and uh, our objective is to uh, make sure that journalists are able to conduct their, their work to engage in journalism without the fear of retaliation. Unfortunately, that's a huge problem in Mexico because it is the deadliest country for journalists in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so what we're, what we're, uh, as, we, as we try to achieve that goal, what we do is um, we try to connect them with the necessary with the relevant authorities. We try to give them assistance. Uh, we try to create a body of work by which we map uh, the exact threats and challenges that uh, journalists and media are facing here. And we also um, uh, provide information to reporters that they can work with. Well, the primary source of threats against journalism is often interpreted as coming from organized crime. But in reality, uh, the answer is a little bit more complicated because what we see in Mexico is that organized crime very often colludes with the authorities, uh, especially on a local level. So when you look at the uh, the mere statistics of you know who commits more aggressions against uh, against journalists, you often actually see the authorities coming out on top with more than 50% of those cases. But these might be police officers that work together with organized crime. These might be um, criminals that have been postulated as political candidates. So the, the, the line between those two is often very blurry, and uh, that actually complicates our work a lot, because when we're trying to document uh, cases of violence against a reporter, and we're trying to figure out who's behind it, we often find that it's a little bit of both. Uh, so it's a bit of a mixed bag in that sense, uh, which is, you know, obviously a sign how serious the situation is. You know, the question of whether uh, I'm, I've personally been in danger uh, is, a, is a little bit of a different question than whether a Mexican journalist is in danger, because the, the way foreigners operate here is quite different from Mexican journalists. Um, I've been in situations that were, that I could consider quite risky. Uh, for example, I've done a, a story several years ago when I went to a town in northern Mexico that was uh, completely under control by uh, one certain criminal group. And I wasn't completely aware of the level of risk for that, which is an error that you know that journalists often make here. Uh, and I ended up, you know, being questioned by uh, somebody who very who quite overtly belonged to organized crime. You know, that said, um, it's very, very rare, exceedingly rare, for foreign journalists to be the subject to the same threats that Mexican journalists receive. Because we don't, uh, first of all, we don't conduct the same level of investigation usually here, meaning that we don't touch as much on the interest of uh, um, of organized crime and of certain, you know, corrupt politicians, for example, as uh, as Mexican journalists do. And foreigners are tend to be, you know, they tend to get a bit of a pass when it comes to the violence here. Uh, that's not to say that foreign journalists don't get into rough situations. We get plenty of reports from. Uh, Foreign correspondents who have been in trouble, who lose their equipment, uh, who've been threat threatened when they went to certain places, but it's 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 a very different situation than it is for Mexican journalists. The Mexican government has, uh, at least on paper, uh, undertaken several important steps to provide you know to improve the protection of journalists. Uh, for example, they created in 2006 a special prosecutor's office, uh, which was renamed in 2010 and was subject to a constitutional amendment in 2012 which added to its, uh, based to its judicial tools in order to you know, procure and impart justice. They also in 2012 created a legal in institutional framework based on the uh, newly adopted law for the protection of journalists and uh, human rights defenders and there's, a sen there's an executive uh, victims commission which was part of the creation of the, um, uh, the general law for victims. Now, these on paper, these sounds like very sort of progressive uh, steps that should provide more protection. But obviously, when we look at the numbers, you know, the, the, the trend of deadly violence against journalists in Mexico has been going up since 2014, with 2017 being one of the worst years in modern history, and that trend continuing in 2018. So clearly, despite the fact that this legal and institutional framework is in place, the situation hasn't necessarily improved. It, in fact, it's gotten worse. And um, the reason for that is that 
no no institution, no legal framework um, aimed specifically at the protection and uh, of journalists and improving the freedom of the press in the country is uh, sufficient if the Mexican government doesn't sincerely and genuinely combat the generalized context of violence uh, against all of its citizens. It's, it's basically just a drop in the ocean. And that's the reason why, despite the fact that, and I work with these institutions on a day-by-day -day basis, I see that there are plenty of people there that are genuinely focused on, uh, on improving the situation. Their work is ultimately pretty much nullified because other levels of, uh, of government, including on a state, uh, the federal government or municipal government, simply do not have a sincere interest in in improving the situation and that that's that's one of the what that's one of the major tragedies for journalists in mexico is that even though they have someone to turn to they actually don't have someone to turn to uh, well i mean whether whether the the new government of uh, andres manuel lopez obrador is really a progressive government remains to be seen uh, so far many of the things that he has proposed since he was elected in the office on july 1st have been um, proposals that uh, are from a sort of classical Mexican uh, political playbook. Uh, he has not spoken much about freedom of the press during the campaign. He hasn't spoken much about it after the election. Um, I've spoken with his prospective uh, interior secretary and several other officials, and uh, there are some proposals there that are aimed at strengthening existing institutions that um, that are focused on the protection of journalists. So, you know, there might be some uh, some positive things to uh, to report there. Unfortunately, many other proposals that are uh, that were given by the Lopez Obrador transition team. They're, they've been a little bit blurry. They've been short of. They've been very, very lar uh, long on broad strokes uh, in sweeping statements, but they've been very short on details. And uh, ultimately, most experts agree that what needs to be done to improve the situation for journalists in Mexico it means that the Mexican government needs to create an integral approach to the protection, to the procurement of justice, to the impartition of justice. It needs to strengthen the justice state. It needs to make the judiciary more independent. Uh, and it needs to um, to seriously <clears throat> undertake a process of strengthening the police. Now, I haven't seen or heard many of these uh, these proposals uh, coming out of the transition team. I don't know what the thoughts of Lopez Obrador are on this, and I think that's a little bit worrisome. The fact that the the new government hasn't uh, hasn't been very explicit in what it wants to do. But what I do what do makes me gives me. Uh, a positive attitude is the fact that uh, the transition team, the prospective members of uh, Mr. Lopez Obrador's cabinet, have been very open to speak with civil society. So there's a dialogue going on, and that's always a good thing. Uh, one, one major caveat, though, is that Mexico is a federal republic, and it's a very large federal republic. And uh, it has a somewhat dysfunctional federal system, meaning that uh, the federal government can only do so many things. And the states also need to collaborate with the federal government if it wants to uh, develop meaningful policies. And on the state level, it's, it's, it's also a very mixed bag. You have some parties uh, uh, control certain states, other parties control other states. Some of them have a, have a proven track record of doing something, others don't. And I actually, when seeing as how the vast majority of journalists who face violence and threats uh, and whose freedom has been restricted by um, by the generalized context of violence in Mexico, work in a state level and not in Mexico City and don't have to deal as much with the federal government as we do, it means that if the states don't collaborate and if Mr. Lopez Obrador doesn't find a way to implement policies on a meaning in a meaningful way on a state level, then it's going to be very difficult in the next six years uh, as he... Uh, as, 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 as his presidency, uh, presidency progresses. So I, I'm, let's say I'm carefully optimistic, but also very wary of what we're going to deal with. Yeah, the, well, the, the differences between Mexico City and, uh, uh, and it's not just Mexico City, by the way, I should also mention that there are some major cities like Guadalajara <clears throat> and Monterrey, uh, where the situation is quite comparable to Mexico City. But, you know, in, in, in broad, uh, uh, in broad strokes, the uh, Mexico's federal republic, Mexico City, its capital is a state by itself. It's also a city that, um, including its surrounding municipalities, has about 25, 20%, 15% of the entire country's population. So that's where all the power is concentrated. That's where the major educational institutions are concentrated. That's where the richest and the most influential media are concentrated. 
Um, so it, it really is the capital of the country, meaning that the civic culture and the way government functions in Mexico City is different from the rest of the country in the sense that Mexico City is a little bit more progressive, it's a little bit more liberal, it's also a little bit more effective in implementing certain human rights policies in comparison to the rest of the country. Now, you go to the rest of the country, to the states, you often see that um, there might be governments that are progressive or there might be governments that are incredibly uh, retrograde in the way they approach civic culture, freedom of the press, uh, organized crime, uh, safety for their, for, for their own citizens. And uh, the way that influences press freedom and uh, the way journalists can work and protection for journalists is that when a crime is committed against a journalist in, uh, in a state like, say, Tamaulipas, which is one of the most violent states in the country, or Veracruz, or Guerrero, other, other very violent states, um, initially, these crimes uh, need to be handled by the local uh, attorney general's office and by the local authorities. Now, these local authorities are dysfunctional in these states. They, they are, they've proven unwilling or incapable, or in the worst cases, both, um, of properly investigating crimes against journalists, of, uh, of dealing with evidence, of, you know, trying to get a conviction. And uh, then the federal government has to swoop in at some point under certain conditions. But the federal government, uh, and in this, in this particular case, when it comes to journalists, it's the Special Prosecutor's Office for Crimes Committed Against Freedom of Expression, the federal has to declare itself competent. It has to make a discretionary decision on whether it wants to attract a case or not. Um, the judges will be involved. Uh, communication needs to be involved with the local authorities, which depends a lot on the uh, on the goodwill of both parties. And that makes it a bureaucratic nightmare very often for um, for cases of uh, uh, of journalists to 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 end up in you know in the uh, in the corresponding authorities. And that's what makes it very difficult for journalists in the States, because they can't count on the local authorities. In fact, you know, as we mentioned before, local journalists are often the, the target of uh, local authorities, like police officers, like local politicians, etc. And uh, then when the federal government finally decides to swoop in, after a long bureaucratic struggle to attract a case, then you know, the trail's already gone cold, evidence has been lost, people have become incredibly frustrated, uh, and that's the root cause of impunity. And impunity, um, that's something that we haven't mentioned before in this, uh, in this conversation, but the levels of, impun of impunity in crimes against journalists are actually higher than a general level of impunity against uh, journalists. Um, CPJ has published a list last year, uh, we do that every year, it's called the Global Impunity in Index, in which we calculate the level of impunity um, in crimes against reporters worldwide. And Mexico is sixth on that list. And the first five are countries that are in a state of conventional war or civil war, like Iraq, Syria, Yemen, uh, the Philippines, Afghanistan. So that gives you an idea of how, how difficult the situation here is. And the dysfunctional federal system in Mexico is, uh, plays a very important part in that, uh, in that impunity. The, uh, the effect that um, the generalized context of violence has, especially against human rights defenders and journalists, and I think it's important to point out here that human rights defenders and journalists are, 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 uh, are more often the target of violence than, uh, than regular citizens in the sense that they are on the forefront of, um, of their, they, they often touch on the interests of very powerful people, whether it's organized crime or whether it's politicians or whether it's, or whether it's the army, they expose themselves to violence and uh, meaning that they, you know, they very, they very often become the target of it. And the generalized context of violence in Mexico has a paralyzing effect on civil society, on freedom of expression, on, uh, on freedom of the press, uh, and on the willingness of people to engage in meaningful dialogue with each other and with the government to make Mexico a better, uh, a better place. Um, activists have become the target of forced disappearance, their uh, human rights defenders are, uh, are tortured, they're murdered, they're displaced. Uh, Mexico has one of the highest rates of internal displacement in the entire Western Hemisphere after Colombia. And you know those those are those are those are those are terrible numbers because ultimately it erodes civic culture. Um, it provides very powerful, you know, the powers that be. It provides them 
with a context in which they can do whatever they want. They, you know, they can they can pollute the environment if it suits their interests. They can silence media if it suits their interests. They can uh, uh, they can conduct fraudulent uh, elections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it has overall a very um, disheartening, uh, a very paralyzing effect on the way Mexicans interact with with each other and uh, and with their government and that ultimately is a very dangerous situation because Mexican Mexican democracy is relatively young Mexican democracy is relatively fragile it's relatively vulnerable it needs journalists it needs human rights defenders it needs people who are on the vanguard to speak out and fortunately and that's the, the you know on the flip side there there there's still thousands of, uh, of people here who despite the violence are are fearless they're motivated and they uh, they go out to speak their mind and they go out to to to, to promote the causes that the, that are important to them. But uh, if there if if nothing meaningful is done within the next years, then the already fragile trust that people have in their own institutions, in their own state, will continue to deteriorate, and it will make the situation even harder, having an exponentially worse effect. On, uh, on 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 democracy here, and on the way people conduct, uh, you know, uh, and on civic culture, and on the way people conduct their their activities with relation to to issues that are uh, that are uh, important for human rights, for the environment, of freedom of the press. Okay, so for the Mexican government to move forward and combat all the problems that we've been talking about in this interview, I think it's important to point out that uh, improving the economic circumstances for Mexicans is something that every Mexican government should always have as one of their top priorities. This is a country where uh, approximately f uh, anywhere between 40 and 50 percent of the population lives below the poverty line. There are indigenous communities that are marginalized, that are living in extreme poverty. Um, there's a lack of well-paying, uh, good jobs in, in, in many areas. Uh, the Mexican economy is very, uh, is very focused on manufacturing and trade, but not, not as much on innovation and development. So these are all issues that, um, that any Mexican government should deal with. However, if you look at the most urgent issues of crime and uh, crime insecurity, um, these are issues that are not by definition caused by poverty, although poverty obviously plays a role. But uh, you know, lots of uh, lots of academics here have investigated the issues and have come to the conclusion that it's a matter of strengthening institution and engaging in a meaningful, open, and democratic dialogue with civil society. Uh, one of the things that the incoming government has recently done is they've organized so-called for uh, forums in different parts of the country. Uh, ostensibly with the intention of speaking with civil society uh, about how they should deal with the issues that we've been talking about. Now, these forums have so far not been very successful, principally because the Mexican government decided that it wasn't, uh, there wasn't going to be a sort of two-way dialogue. It was going to be a monologue and the government basically uh, explaining its policies instead of listening to people in areas where there's lots of violence. That's not the way to go about this. What you need to do as a Mexican government is to, is to look at the root causes of crime and violence, of the most urgent issues. You see that there's a dysfunctional police apparatus, there's a dysfunctional justice state. You see that there's, a, uh, there's an enormous disconnect between, to give you an, a, a more technical example, between the kind of police work that judges need in order to reach convictions and the kind of police work that, that policemen in Mexico that are suffering from lack of armament, lack of training and corruption are capable of even conducting, you know, these kinds of issues need to be dealt with and the only way the Mexican government can do that is by listening to its own citizens. And a huge problem with Mexican governments, successful Mexican governments, uh, since long before I arrived here in Mexico uh, about a decade ago, has been is that they, they don't really listen to their own citizens. They don't really listen to what the intricacies of the issues are on a local level, and they haven't, they haven't shown a genuine interest in solving it. They've shown an interest in creating more bureaucracy, in broad statements, in, um, uh, in, 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 in grand gestures, but the, this, isn't, this isn't what people need. What people need is justice, a functioning justice state. What people need is to get these is to get the feeling that the state is listening to them and that they are participants in a democratic process that, that ultimately has the intention of making their lives better. So I would say that uh, summing summing this up, I would say that the Mexican government needs to strengthen its institutions and conduct an open and honest dialogue with civil society 
before it can, you know, it can move any further. Instead of just creating more bureaucracy, uh, instead of just creating more laws that are, uh, uh, while existing laws have proved completely woefully insufficient, <clears throat> and that's that's, uh, and let's hope that the incoming government is going to do that. It's, it's been a mixed bag. The signs have been. You know, you can be optimistic depending on what you see. You can be pessimistic, but I do hope that they uh, they continue at least the current tendency of uh, of showing a certain openness to speak with people. Well, the idea of uh, re-victimization is what we call it in in crimes against journalists is very clear. The idea is to disqualify the victims of crimes uh, uh, against journalists, so reporters that are victims of violence. Uh, something that uh, different levels of authority in Mexico often do is they very soon after a journalist was murdered or was disappeared or was the victim of threats, etc., uh, an official might uh, go public by saying, well, the crime has nothing to do with our journalism or, oh, well, the journalist had bad contacts. Well, something that Mexican authorities very often mention is andaba en malos pasos. He was acting badly. Yeah. He was having the wrong context. He was having, uh, uh, he was part of organized crime. This idea of disqualifying, of blaming the victim, uh, which we call re-victimization, has uh, the, the purpose of it is to uh, basically cover up the unwillingness of the authorities to do their job, and also to disqualify journalists uh, so as to to attack their credibility. And uh, it's a serious problem. It, happen, it, happen, it, it happens less and less now because the outcry from civil society about it, uh, including from ourselves, has been has been massive in recent years. But I remember, you know, there are cases in Veracruz, for example, of uh, particularly of Moises Sanchez, when the then governor of Veracruz, who's currently in jail over over corruption, organized crime, and graft charges, uh, just bluntly went out there and and and, and told the, the public opinion that the uh, that the journalist who was, who was kidnapped and murdered was just a taxi driver uh, so it's not important to investigate it and obviously his goal was to divert the attention from this being a crime against one of the fundamental rights of Mexicans which is the right of access to information and the freedom of expression and these are rights that are enshrined in the Constitution so if you attack that it's a federal crime it's uh, specifically when public uh, officials are involved, as were uh, as was most likely the case in this uh, particular murder. So you 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 wash your hands of uh, a very very important responsibility of the state, and you isolate and disqualify the reporters uh, so that you know it doesn't become a thorn a thorn in your side as an authority. And uh, I think that's 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 just um, it's very blatant and it's it's very serious and. Uh, it's very disheartening when these things happen. Um, well, there's, I mean, I mean, there's always an element of idealism uh, when you when you live and work as a foreign correspondent. I mean, you wanna uh, you wanna inform people. In my case, back in Europe, of what's going on here, you wanna you know you wanna let them know about the intricacies. Uh, you wanna combat prejudices, uh, and uh, you would like your work to be impactful. Um, that was always the case when I worked for Dutch media, and you know when I started switching a little bit to you know, to Anglo-Saxon media, like in the, in the United States and in uh, in the UK and in Canada. Uh, but one thing I always found a bit li a bit uh, limited about the way I was working is that the impact, the direct impact that I had when I published articles in in, in, in for example Dutch newspaper Tau, which I still work for, it's relatively limited. And after I started working for the Committee to Protect Journalists, I noticed that uh, whatever I did, it had a direct impact on the lives of reporters here. You know, if, I, if, a, if a journalist called me and told me that uh, they were in danger, that they were getting threats, that they need assistance, uh, and I started work, you know, I started calling the Mexican institutions, uh, trying to make sure that they were enrolled in a Mexican, in a federal uh, mechanism for the protection of journalists. Uh, despite all its flaws, it, it still has a few aspects of it that's, that work really well. Uh, or when I asked for assistance from CPJ in New York, or when I uh, published an article that was uh, uh, quoted a lot in Mexican media, I found out that the direct impact was much higher. So when I, st when I started working for CPJ about two years ago, uh, it sort of reinvigorated that idealism that I had and it made it sharper and more focused. So I don't, I'm not sure whether I'm more idealistic now than I used to be, uh, but I'm definitely more aware of the direct impact of my work, which is a very, 
positive motivating factor in, 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 in continuing to do it. Okay, so I'm, I'm always optimistic because being pessimistic is not part of my job description. And if you're a pessimist, then you are unable to work as a human rights uh, as a human rights activist, I think. I think every human rights activist, everybody here who's working in what we do, freedom of expression, freedom of press, has to have a de degree of optimism because otherwise, uh, because otherwise there's no reason to carry on. But um, when I say that I'm optimistic, it's not just because I have to force myself to be, it's also because I see reason to be optimistic. I see it in Mexico, uh, uh, at least here in Mexico City, I see it in the civic culture. I see people that are extremely motivated, that are very idealistic, that are, very, that, that are trying to push forward, that are trying to, uh, that are trying to make the country better. And every once in a while they claim small victories that, that uh, lay the groundwork for future success. Um, so I, I think um, there is a, a civic culture slowly developing in the major cities, in the states here in Mexico. That uh, that may be the seed for an improved democracy in the near future. Uh, you see a lot of human rights defenders that carry on despite all the adverse circumstances because they believe that there's reason for them to uh, to carry on, and I think they're right. My point here being is that I think that uh, that it, it often seems that human rights defenders and journalists are carrying on against overwhelming odds. But uh, I do see little successes, and I do believe that based on that, uh, Mexico will, can, and will become a better place in the future. And that's also what drives me. And especially, you know, my, the, the, the people I'm working with here, the Mexicans, they're, they're, they're unbelievably uh, aware of what they need to do. Uh, they're unbelievably talented. Um, they're, they're, these are people I admire and look up to, and uh, they're the ones who, you know, keep pushing me forward as well.